E-Cancer Television continues now with a, a fascinating topic because it, it gets us on to differentiation that's at the heart of cancer, actually. And uh, you, uh, Professor Paolo Pandolfi, have been awarded the Pets Cola International Award. Congratulations, that's happened right here. And Thank you. it's I think it's for your work on... on um, APL, isn't it? Acute promyelocytic Yeah, leukemia. I think that I would say that the award was given because of this phenomenal story which uh, pertains to a leukemia which only 20 years ago was considered a killer and now is considered curable if not eradicated on the basis of differentiation therapy, on the basis of targeted therapies that uh, really are geared to destroy the oncogene, the, the bad uh, driver of the leukemia. So and you've been able to reverse the process, the cancer yes. process, so to speak. And actually now, if you are diagnosed APL, you are uh, select, happy. you are happy in a sense, while 20 years ago was a dead sentence, but also you could be uh, routed to a specific treatment with targeted therapies, then uh, admitted, treated and sent home cured and off drug, which is the ultimate definition of cure. You know, in cancer, we cannot uh, uh, mention many examples whereby the patient goes home disease-free and drug-free. APL is one of them. And actually, now by now, we are uh, trying to remove consolidation chemotherapy. So this will be the first cancer to be treated solely and cured solely with targeted therapies. And go home and forget about it. Yes, which is not happening in other cancer where uh, success, nevertheless, uh, was called, such as chronic myelogenous leukemia, where the patients are still uh, treated on a daily basis. Mm. Give me the brief story yeah. of what you did in terms of APL. What was the key, key process? So the story, I, I was lucky or, or privileged to uh, follow it from uh, the identification of the genetic makeup, meaning we found the fusion genes which are uh, associated with APL, while I was last year medical student, believe it or not. And then the saga of APL went through a phase of mouse modeling. We could reintroduce the faulty genes of human APL into the mouse, generating faithful mouse model of APL. And then we could use these little patients to optimize treatment. And as a matter of fact, the treatment uh, and the combination of drugs that is given to patients, human patients nowadays, is based entirely on mouse uh, preclinical efforts. So you tried all transretinoic acid and retinoic and acid in uh, combination in mice, and we could demonstrate because APL, by the way, uh, this is a side issue, but very important, is not one, but many, although it's already a subtype of acute my myelogenous leukemia. We know of six different genotypes. We could recreate the genetic complexity of each and every genotype in the mouse and then optimize treatment according to the genetic makeup. Now that's APL, a big that's success APL, story. Yeah. You've just been awarded yeah, the prize. Yeah. What about lung cancer? Because you're now looking in the same way at lung cancer. And you're also looking at models as well, aren't yeah. you? Yeah, so the, we have uh, applied this logic and actually we, we tried to expedite this approach, which is from mouse to, to man, in a, a way by which we synchronize now at Harvard Medical School, at our cancer center, each and every experimental human trial with a parallel preclinical trial in mouse model of that type of cancer. So we are doing this for prostate, for lung, for breast, for endometrial, for ovarian cancer, leukemia, and so on. So imagine that a new experimental drug is tested in the prostate cancer clinic. We enroll each and every mouse model of prostate cancer in exactly the same way, performing exactly the same trial, and then we stratify patients on the basis of the response or the resistance we find in these mouse models. Now, I want to ask you about the actual process of modeling, yeah. but first, I can't resist asking you how far you've got with lung cancer. So with lung cancer, actually, uh, although lung cancer is still a very, very serious form of cancer, the progresses in modeling lung cancer and in testing drugs in lung cancer are extremely rewarding, meaning that we have been able to recreate the diversity underlying the genetics of lung cancer. And uh, what we find by doing this integrated approach is that the mouse predicts in full if uh, certain patients would respond or not. For instance, I'm sure you know that there is ALK, which is another important driver of lung cancer. And by now there are ALK inhibitors, which seem to work. We have been able to demonstrate that they do work in the mouse version of the ALK lung cancer. And we now study how we can combine this drug with conventional chemotherapy or with further 
experimental therapeutics. So I would say that lung cancer is one of the most accomplished and advanced uh, form of cancer in this respect. Mm. There, there is a paradox because although uh, mice and other animals are absolutely essential to the process of developing new drugs, simply couldn't be done without them. Still, clinicians are a little suspicious of something that works in a mouse. They're not totally sure it'll work in a man. How can you bridge that suspicion? Because you've now set it yeah, in a very careful way. I think that uh, the, the suspicion is due to an historical uh, misconception, which is that uh, the mouse models that people uh, look with, very, uh, with great skepticism uh, are mostly mouse models in which you would uh, inject cell lines coming from human tumors the so-called xenograph. In testing drugs in xenograph, oftentimes we were misled. Drugs that seemed to work didn't work and so on. Here the approach is completely different. The mouse model we use are mouse models which are engineered to express the human faulty gene and that spontaneously develop uh, lung cancer, prostate cancer, leukemia, driven by the human gene. And uh, we have much more control on that kind of cancer, which is an endogenous cancer, much more knowledge vis-a-vis a -vis cell line which has been in the lab for many, many years and has drifted. You know, the, the cell lines, simply put, rarely represent the cancer of origin. So it's they're scientifically extremely interesting, fascinating yeah. work, but could be unrelated to the clinical and, and situation. The data which we got from Xenograph was misleading. And this is the reason why historically people think about mouse model as really non-predictive tools. But this is a different type of modeling. This is recreating the complexity of the genetics of human cancer in a mouse, which is engineered in that way. Okay, what practical things would you now say to doctors? Are there any steps forward that you've already made that can be applied? And what kind of new hopes for improving and refining individualized cancer therapy would you hold out as a result of using your so animal models? The, 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 the goal is now to accelerate the process which in my opinion is working and will work. You know, the, the question is how to tackle complexity. We have way too many drugs to be tested, which is good news for the patients on the one end, but has to be done and has to be done rapidly. People don't want to wait another 40 years to, to, have, uh, to gain two months on a specific subtype of cancer. And yet we are confronted with the fact that we have way too many drugs to test if you, you want to test them in the classical phase one, phase two, phase three. So we believe that uh, the process is there. The question is how to speed it up how to test this drug, how to test them combinatorially. And we think that uh, the mouse, along with the genomic revolution, gives a unique opportunity. And so this integrated approach whereby you uh, seek the information in the human cancer and then you parallel this information with the mouse cancer and you see which drug works and where is the way to go. And is there anything you can do now? If you're a clinician, you've got a patient, does this help you at the moment or is it all for the future? It is experimental, but uh, just to give you a concrete example of how this revolution is impacting, by now at our cancer center we are sequencing the cancer genome of each and every patient in a systematic manner in order to stratify on the basis of this, ge this genomic information. And there are major hurdles for, you know, gl global health uh, system because how do you pay for this effort? At the moment uh, we are paying through philanthropic support, but how do you get reimbursed for such an analysis. The hope is that the cost of uh, genome sequencing drops. But I mean, in practical term, we are already using the genomic information to guide therapy. This is the most, I would say, immediate uh, implication. And we're on the threshold of a new, more information-rich era that will help the clinicians. I absolutely, I'm absolutely convinced that this is the case and is not only going to be the case in the future, it's already on now. Paolo, thank you very much for joining us on eCancer Television. Thank you.